Hi there, this is Dr. Robert Sivis, the Carb Addiction Doc, and today we are going to start or continue a mini-series specific to type 1 diabetics. The very first part of this discussion is to understand insulin and what insulin does. So the first concept is that in a normal human being, a non-diabetic person, when you eat carbohydrates, and that's the first path we're going to take through the intestinal tract as you eat carbohydrates. And the first thing is it doesn't matter how the carbohydrates enter your face. They can be complex as a starch or simple as a sugar. They can be man-made or um, God or nature made. It doesn't matter. But starting in your mouth with certain enzymes and all the way through the intestinal tract, those sugars are going to be broken down. And whether they're complex or simple, it determines the rate at which those sugars are broken down. And, the, and once they're broken down into their individual, what we call monosaccharides, glucose, galactose, fructose, which are the three monosaccharides, they get absorbed at various stages in the small intestine. No sugars, as far as we are aware, get absorbed in the colon. And as far as we are aware, the stomach doesn't also absorb a lot of sugar. So it's from the beginning to the end of the small intestine based upon how complex those um, sugars are. So one of the first conceptual thinking is that sugar gets absorbed at a specific rate depending on how complex it is when it goes into your mouth. In other words, how much work your intestine has to do to break it down. So if you eat pure glucose, it's being absorbed almost right away. If you eat pasta, it's going to take a longer time to uh, get absorbed. And that's called the glycemic index. The second concept is how much total carbohydrate you eat, whether it irrespective of how it goes in, ice cream or pasta or brown bread or white bread, it doesn't matter. That is called the glycemic load. And most people that treat diabetes, the endocrinologists, are obsessed or heavily focused on glycemic index or glycemic load. And as long as that's who you are, we have a huge problem, Houston, when it comes to treating diabetics. I'll get back to that in the second part. So that's what enters your face. Now, on the other side, on a true diabetic ketogenic or, or carnivore diet, you are not putting carbohydrates in your face. So the difference is people who eat carbohydrates of some sort, sugar or starch, and people who do not. And there are diabolically different ways in which your body responds and reacts to those two situations. And I'll discuss each. So when you eat carbohydrates, irrespective of so-called good or bad, which is a, another crazy way to define them, they go into your mouth, they go into your intestinal tract. And the way the body is a very complex system. So as your eyes see that food, as your nose smells them, as the sugar receptors, the sweet receptors on your taste buds taste them, that is the beginning of a very complex signaling pathway that occurs throughout your intestine. So what happens is, in your, with your eyes, your brain, your, your nose, um, your mouth, uh, your stomach acid production, your upper intestine, where you produce something called GLP-1, you uh, produce cholecystokinin, CCK, uh, uh, GIP, you produce peptide YY a little lower down. These are all what we call incretins, they're signaling hormones that allow the other hormones in your body to understand or to recognize that there's an incoming load of sugar. And what those hormones do, for example, GLP-1 is a trigger to your pancreatic cells, the islet cells, the beta cells of the islets of the pancreas to begin to release insulin. So that insulin's kind of waiting for that sugar load to enter. And the way sugar works is Throughout the small intestine, sugar is being absorbed into the intestinal bloodstream. And the intestinal bloodstream is something called a portal system. In, in, in other words, a portal system is one that runs between or, two organs. And the two organs is your intestine and your liver. So the majority of blood from your intestine doesn't go to your general body. It goes directly to the, to the liver. And that's called the first pass effect. And the liver then under the influence of insulin, starts to remove that sugar from the bloodstream and removes a variable, very high percentage of sugar, 
from the bloodstream under the influence of insulin. Okay, so there's also what we believe to be a glucostat, this mythical thing that occurs in that portal venous system that triggers insulin. So, and is a different scenario when you're injecting insulin intravenously. So let's say I've got a, an intravenous drip, an IV, that's injecting insulin into my bloodstream. It's going in, in a completely different pathway, and it defies the signaling system from the intestine. That's a different story, but the metrics are a little bit different. So, uh, and in the lab, we can measure portal venous uh, um, uh, blood sugar, in uh, an animal, but we can't do that effectively in humans. So what happens anyway is that sugar goes up the portal venous system to the liver, the liver extracts a certain amount, some of it does spill over into the rest of the bloodstream, and once it gets through the, through the liver, it goes to your whole body. And that's where your muscles, your brain, your tissues, all of those can absorb uh, uh, absorb that sugar and clear it from the bloodstream, not completely, but to maintain your blood sugar in a very, very tight range, which for humans is typically around 70 to 100. That's what we call the glucose insulin clamp. And the human body is designed to clamp sugar very tightly in that range um, that is held there by insulin if your body's insulin uh, sensitive. So now let's shift gears just a little bit, okay? And let's look at the role of insulin. And the first concept that is kind of an archaic concept to my mind is this concept of catabolism and anabolism. Catabolism means breaking down, anabolism means forming. I don't like those, those principles because that's not the way the body works. You cannot divide things into uh, things that get given up and things that get taken up, body building and body breakdown. The body just doesn't do that. The body works on continuous, what we call homeostasis cycling. There's continuous alterations, micro alterations. So think about this. If you've got a guitar, guitar string and you pluck the guitar string and your finger dampens the vibrations of that guitar string, that's more like how your body works. And if you pluck that guitar string hard, you need hard pressure. If you just touch it, you need light pressure. But there's this continuous sensitivity that, that is an interplay in your body. But it's not one direction versus another. <coughs> Excuse me, that's not the way the body works. So let's look at the roles of insulin. And obviously, it's very, very complex. And these are not in order uh, of importance. But the first thing that insulin does... Um, when you're not eating, is insulin controls or switches on or, or, or switches off a hormone called glucagon. Now, glu one of glucagon's responsibilities is to produce and release sugar by and from the liver. So as your blood sugar goes up, even if you haven't eaten, that can happen under glucagon. Everybody understands the Dawn effect, which is a release of sugar by glucagon under the influence of cortisol. Blood sugar goes up, insulin should be released, and insulin blocks glucagon, and your blood sugar drops down just a little bit because it's not being released or produced. So there's this intimate relationship between glucagon and insulin, and in fact, the alpha and beta cells of the, are in the pancreas. One secretes glucagon, one secretes insulin, and they're right next to each other in the pancreas. So there's a direct connection as well as a connection through the bloodstream. So that's the first influence of insulin, and it's this intimate dance, it's this relationship between the two. The second thing that insulin does is insulin shuts off fat mobilization. It affects the fat cells, uh, uh, an enzyme called lipoprotein lipase. Lipoprotein lipase is the hormone or the, uh, sorry, the enzyme that allows the breakdown and the release of fat that is stored in fat cells. And obviously you don't want an elevated sugar in your bloodstream and elevated ketones or fat as an energy source, you want one or the other. So insulin regulates release of fat from the fat cells. It switches it on or off, but it's not on or off. It's kind of a grade. And um, insulin then modifies the ratio of sugar to fat in the bloodstream. And it's a continuous sensitivity. It's a continuous cycling. So that's the second part that insulin has, a uh, role that insulin has. And then the third role that insulin has is to allow cells that are insulin sensitive to remove sugar from the bloodstream. 
Yes, that happens in the liver, that happens in fat cells, but it also happens in muscles, in the brain, in a variety of different, pretty much every tissue in the human body, where insulin facilitates under the influence of certain receptors, little channels, little gates, little transport molecules that allow sugar, glucose, to get from the bloodstream into the cells and into the mitochondria where it is used as an energy source. So those are the roles of insulin. And then there's a further role of insulin. Under a very heavy consumption of sugar over a period of time, of carbohydrates over a period of time, insulin actually directs, in particular the liver, to convert sugar to fat. So the majority of this, the majority of the pork on my belly right here, didn't come from the consumption of fat. It came from the conversion of sugar of chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption into sugar and then into, sorry, into glucose and then into fat. So insulin has the secondary role where um, it converts sugar to fat, but that's not a primary role because if your homeostatic mechanism is working perfectly, there should be a perfect ebb and flow and no storage as fat or very little storage as fat. Yes, influence can, can transfer the consumption of fat uh, under that influence into or out of the fat cells. But the chylomicron absorption of fat by the fat cells is insulin independent as far as we're aware. Um, and that's talk for another day. So insulin is not just regulating blood sugar. It's regulating all the other hormones that regulate blood sugar. And then there's another role that insulin has that nobody really speaks about. Okay, One of the beautiful things about the human body is it's a very simple system that has these beautiful complex pathways. So one of the precursor molecules for so many different hormones is a molecule called cholesterol. About a third of our cholesterol is produced in our cells and two thirds of that cholesterol on average should be in our diet. But Cholesterol is a vital precursor molecule for all of the steroid hormones. What does that mean? Cholesterol through a series of enzymes, for example, 21 enzymes, cholesterol becomes estrogen in females. Cholesterol becomes testosterone in males. And it's really cool. If you Google an image of cholesterol and an image of testosterone, you'll see that they're almost identical, except testosterone has lost this little chain at the top. So um, cholesterol is a precursor, and through a series of enzymes, it gets converted to estrogen, to testosterone, to growth hormone, to uh, cortisol, to T3, T4, the thyroid hormones, to vitamin D3, cholecalciferol, and cholesterol is also vital as it's excreted in bile to absorb vitamins A, D, E, K. The fat-soluble vitamins get absorbed in this bile micelle or this bile complex bile molecule, and they actually get absorbed directly into the systemic blood system and go to the fat cells or elsewhere in the body. So why is insulin important in that pathway? Because insulin regulates the rate at which cholesterol gets turned into those downstream hormones. Insulin regulates some of the very first enzymatic steps of the conversion of cholesterol downstream to all those other hormones. So the classic example, the most obvious example, is people who are high producers of insulin, I call them the high insulin producers, often and usually will have, if they're eating a lot of sugar or starch, which creates that insulin to go up when they become insulin resistant, those people will typically have polycystic ovarian syndrome, PCOS as a female, or low testosterone as a male. Why does that happen? Because insulin blocks the very first enzymatic step in that process. And as they become insulin sensitive by not eating carbohydrates, the insulin number goes down and then they're able to produce testosterone and estrogen better and your risk, likelihood of pregnancy, your likelihood of, of normalization of testosterone, we've demonstrated with our patients by measuring those all the time, restores back to normal. Where's that important in diabetes is that insulin actually regulates some of the stress hormones. For example, cortisol production. Cortisol precursor is actually cholesterol. It's one of your steroid hormones. So cortisol is a, a, a the precursor for cortisol 
is uh, cholesterol and insulin modifies the production of cortisol to a certain extent. What does that do? It affects fatigue and energy level. It, aff it affects inflammatory response, tissue healing, tissue repair, inflammation. And it also directly and indirectly affects things like cancer and other inflammatory autoimmune diseases. So there's a very complex role for insulin and the associated hormones in the human body. It's not just about regulating blood sugar. But if you look, step back and look at this big picture of integration, then you understand what happens in type 1 diabetes when the human body no longer is able to produce insulin or sufficient insulin to perform all those tasks. The only difference, the only real major difference between a type 1 diabetic who cannot produce, where their, cell, their beta cells in the pancreas have been damaged to the point that they cannot produce sufficient insulin, and an otherwise normal person, should be the source of insulin. Mine comes from my pancreas. A type 1 diabetic should come from a pump or a needle. And of course, my body is much more microsensitive than a pump or a needle because you're kind of guessing with type two diabetes, type one diabetes. But how do you guess more accurately about what your ongoing insulin needs are? And that's where you have to be sensitive to all those metrics. And in the next segment, we're going to talk about how to treat your blood sugars rather than treating what you're eating. And that's a fundamental change between how endocrinologists manage diabetes and how it should be managed, in my opinion, in the modern era.